welcome to the stage, um, Rebecca Tinsley, um, founder and director of Waging Peace. Put your hands together for Rebecca. Hi, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Excuse me just one second while I try and fathom this out. Could I have a little technical help here from somebody, please? Sorry. Thanks very much. Um, if the, the previous speaker, um, I think rather unfairly, said that um, he was he, he was, uh, his subject was a bit of a downer. Well, wait till you hear me. I'm going to talk about <laughs> genocide. And um, <clears throat> I'm drawing, and, and of course, um, the way women are affected in genocide and post-genocide situations. And I'm going to draw on my experiences in Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Sudan, and northern Uganda. So this is going to be a barrel of laughs. I'm also uh, going to start with a really hard sell. I'm going to ask you to buy my novel um, about Sudan. It's sitting over there. It's 10 pounds. I make absolutely no apology for this. I s started uh, a charity called Network for Africa to run projects helping survivors of genocide in Rwanda and northern Uganda rebuild their lives. And every single penny from that book goes to that. I don't draw salary, I don't take a penny from the charity, so every penny goes to empowering people to get their lives back together. I'm also selling some beautiful jewelry made by Rwandan geno genocide survivors. Again, 10 pounds a string. Uh, I urge you, please, think of giving one of those to somebody for a present. Um, I wrote it as a novel, incidentally, because I thought it would be rather more palatable to people than, than the endless articles I've written since I came back from Darfur, uh, where I was in 2004 at the height of the killing. I've spewed out articles. I've written parliamentary speeches for people. I've written speeches for people like Desmond Tutu. God bless him. Um, and you know what? I'm always speaking to the same audience, people like you who already know about this stuff. So I wrote a novel in an attempt to uh, get people, it's, a, it's an age old thing using art and drama to try and tell people things they don't particularly want to hear, but you know they should hear. Um, it's been assigned to three un US universities because it's regarded as a, a on the syllabus of three US, a US colleges because it's regarded as a painless way of getting your mind around uh, what's been happening in Sudan. Okay, that's the end of the ad. I'm going to very rapidly take you through, uh, I'm going to be referring mostly to Sudan <coughs> in what I say. Um, but I think actually what I need to do is step back a minute and think about the meaning of the word genocide. I think one of our problems is that we tend to think it's an aberration. It's not. It's part of the human condition. It isn't something Turks do. It isn't something Germans do. It's what human beings do. That is why we are just such complicated little critters because we're capable of such acts of beauty and decency, but we're also, all of us, in the right circumstances, capable of monstrous behavior. And if you want an example of that, then I urge you to read a fabulous book called the, um, uh, by a guy called, called um, Philip Zimbardo, uh, called The Lucifer Effect. And it's, he talks about uh, the Stanford Prison uh, experiment 40 years ago, and he also talks about Stanley Milgram's uh, ex experiments in which he got students to do appalling things to each other because we are animals who move in herds, and when we are in a large group, we lose any moral compass. And if you look through any of the genocides I'm going to talk about from you know the beginning uh, of the 20th century when uh, the German colonialists killed the Herrera of Namibia through Armenia, the Holocaust, onwards. There are several um, things that keep happening, patterns, if you will, and, and it's about, it isn't just about racial prejudice and manipulating people and using propaganda uh, to, to instill hatred. It's also about fear, and that's the cleverness, is when you convince people that unless you kill that Tutsi or that Jew or that Armenian, they're going to kill you. So really, you're just defending your family. And that's the brilliance of it. 
And there's a problem here for me, and that is that if you do recognize that we are rather weak little creatures, that we can be manipulated by hate and by fear, that we should realize, because it is part of the human condition, that we should also put a lot more effort into predicting where it will happen. But here's the problem. We have politicians and diplomats and leaders who don't want to hear the warnings. In 1942, a Polish resistance fighter called Jan Karski managed to get out of Poland, and he came to both Britain, and he, got a, he pulled strings in the Jewish community, and he got an audience with both Churchill, and he managed to get to Washington and to see Roosevelt. And he said to both of these leaders, he, he told them what was happening in Europe, he told them what was happening to the Jews. And yet, till the end of the war, when the prison camps were discovered and liberated, they both said they didn't know it was happening. Yet Jan Karski had told them in 1942. And if you go back to the cabinet minutes of those meetings on both sides of the Atlantic, both Roosevelt and Churchill, you know what their comment was? Well, you know, the Jews are rather excitable people as a race. So obviously this little man is exaggerating. And we've had that again and again and again. Uh, Romeo Dallaire, who was the UN commander in Rwanda months before the genocide started in April 94, he was sending messages to the UN saying they're stockpiling weapons, they're training, they're drawing up lists of enemies. It's going to happen. And yet still, Bill Clinton hauls his con conscience around the world telling people, uh, oh, I didn't know it was going to happen. We didn't know it was happening. Really? We're told that we have satellites in space that can read license plates of cars. So how come they didn't know it was happening? This medi you know. To me, this is one of the issues. Is, is, uh, I mentioned pattern, the pattern of stirring up and manipulating people with hate and fear, and then depending on mob mentality, because we all like to do the same thing. There's another pattern to genocide, and that is, we first of all, we ignore the ideology behind genocide, the genocidal intent. God, you know, the number of times Hitler made it perfectly on, obvious from, you know, the, the late 20s onwards what he was going to do to the Jewish population. In 1989, Slobodan Milosevic made a speech in, way, in which he made it absolutely crystal clear what his plan for Yugoslavia was. But again and again and again, we ignore the genocidal ideology because it suits us. And then when it starts happening, we deny the scale of what happens, which takes me to Sudan. There are three reasons why the genocide is happening in Darfur and also incidentally in that border area between uh, the new south of Sudan here and the north, the border running around, around there. There are three reasons for this. The first is traditionally all the power in this country was based with the tribes who live along the Nile. And it's been a story of marginalization for hundreds of years. The people who live in Khartoum and along the Nile have all the power. And the people who live in the regions are pissed off. Uh, and that's been going on for a very long time. The second factor is to do with global warming. And that is that the Sahara is moving south at a rate of as much as 10 miles a year in some places, meaning that the traditionally nomadic Arab tribes their ground, their land is turning into desert. They have to move to find somewhere else to live. Which brings us to the third point, which is the genocidal intent. And I'm afraid to say uh, the, the, there's no way you can get around this. There is a latent racism among quite a few Arabs who live in Sudan. Uh, they, a lot of them regard the black African people who also live in Sudan as racially inferior, and they actually say, uh, that God created black people to be their slaves. The president of Sudan, um, Omar Bashir, um, has been clever in manipulating uh, the, the landless herders, who I mentioned, who, whose land is being destroyed by the Sahara. He wants, basically, he wants Sudan to be Arab and Muslim. And he's got a lot of black Africans and non-Muslims who live there, and he wants to get rid of them. He wants to cleanse them ethnically. And what he's done rather cleverly over uh, since, since he took power in 1989 is that he has manipulated the landless Arab nomads. He's armed them, and he's told them to go and take the land from the black Africans. They've done that in the south of Sudan uh, with a loss of two million lives. Uh, and he's also done that uh, in Darfur, uh, where six million people live. 
uh, and half of them, half of them have been displaced. 90% of the black African villages in Darfur have been destroyed. Now, how you can deny that this is ethnic cleansing, I don't know. I mean, you know, the Janjaweed, who are, uh, that's the colloquial name for the, the Arab nomads who've been armed uh, and paid by the, the Sudanese government. Um, you know, they will literally miss out Arab villages and attack black African ones. So there is a, Bashir, as I say, is using a latent racism there uh, to achieve his ends. And he's been, it's, they call it Rwandan slow motion, and it is genocide on the cheap. Uh, the photograph you see um, behind is uh, what one of the villages in Darfur looks like after an attack. Typically, and this is happening to this day, it's wrong to think this is over, it's not. Um, and a new war, as I say, has flared along the new north-south border as well. What happens typically is that Sudanese armed forces, Antonovs, fly in and they bomb the village to, quote, soften it up. They're followed by um, Janjaweed on horseback and camelback. I, uh, in 2004, I went uh, over to here, to, uh, to El Janina, um, to interview people, women in the refugee camps there, and there was a pattern to what they told me. Um, well, altogether, my uh, little group, Waging Peace, we've interviewed 60,000 people. We've taken 60,000 pieces of testimony, which has been accepted by the International Criminal Court. And uh, the, the similarity is absolutely extraordinary in what the people say happened to them. The Antonov attack, followed by the Janjaweed. You know, I talked to people who saw a column, imagine this, 200 horses wide of people riding towards you, the earth trembling, the dust. Uh, and the, the, the basic um, thing they did when they get to the villages, kill the men, including the boys, throw the kids on the fires so they burn to death, and then uh, systematically rape the women. And I interviewed so many women to whom this had happened, and they, they told me something that, that upset me on all kinds of levels. Um, that's, that's what one of the villages looks like. That photo was taken by a US Marine called Brian Steidel, who flew at great risk, flew over these villages. The women told me um, that there's one particular woman called Hawa who really sticks in my mind. She um, was 18 years old. She had been one of the few people to survive in her village when it was um, bombed and when the Janjaweed came through it. She was gang raped. Now, I met her three weeks after it had happened. She'd been raped so often she still couldn't sit down. She was in that much pain. She'd walked these three weeks to get to the refugee camp. And in my simple little mind, I'd kind of hoped that when you got to a refugee camp in the middle of somewhere like Darfur, someone would give you a cup of tea at least. No, they didn't even give her a house. They just said, you can take that piece of land. And she had to go and find twigs to build herself a house. Anyway, she told me that as she was being gang raped, uh, she was branded like a slave. And they, they uh, showered racial epithets on her. But they said to her, there are going to be three genocides. The first is when we kill your men. The second is when we rape the women, because that's how we destroy your society. It's a genocide of society, because in a traditional, conservative, Muslim, rural community, the status of women is shattered. And therefore, all the family connections are shattered when you rape a woman. A lot of them are then rejected by their communities. God help them if they become pregnant. And these men said the third genocide is when you realize you're HIV positive. And here's the thing. I've interviewed women in Rwanda and in Bosnia, and they said exactly the same thing to me, that they had been told the same thing. And that is what people mean when they say that rape is a weapon of war. Anyway, it was uh, one of these women, Hawa, who asked me to tell their story. And uh, at the time, there were no journalists in Darfur. There still aren't, because guess what? If you're going to have a successful genocide, you do not let the press in, because you do not want evidence. Um, and I said to Hawa, you know, I am not a very good uh, person to do this, because I won the lottery when I was born. I was born white and healthy in North America. And frankly, it just doesn't get any, any luckier than that. And she said to me with perfect African logic, but Rebecca, you're here. 
and no one else is. So she burdened me to try and do something. And one of the things, as I said, I've been doing is spewing out these articles uh, that really appear to make absolutely no difference whatsoever. One of the things we did do, though, was an effort to get evidence. And of course, the truth is politicians and diplomats are pretty selective in what they consider to be evidence, aren't they? One thinks back to the Breadline Q massacre in Sarajevo when the Serbs were bombing the city. And believe it or not, the Serb, they, they lobbed a shell into a bread line in the middle of Sarajevo and they killed 32 people. And the Serbs then went around saying, well, you know, of course, the Bosnians did it to themselves to get your sympathy. And to my absolute shame, the British officials at the time were also saying exactly the same thing, because this was evidence we didn't really want to have. Well, what we did was we collected um, 500 drawings by children in the refugee camps in Darfur. We asked, us, we asked them, their mothers were very concerned about their mental state. Um, it's interesting, a, a friend of mine who worked in, in the camps in Bosnia, when I was saying to her, how are people coping? She said, the men, the men just fall apart. The women, I mean, the, the children, they go silent and God knows what's going on in their heads. The women, they just have to carry on. Somebody has to get everybody up every morning and give them breakfast and, and the women start each day with a song. Anyway, the women were very concerned about the state of their kids. So we collected these drawings, um, 500 of them, they were accepted by the International Criminal Court as evidence of the context of war crimes. And I'm gonna show you some of those drawings. Um, there are the kids doing them. Um, we did incidentally, we were able to go back to these camps and to say to the kids who did the drawing that uh, their, their drawings were one day going to be used, hopefully, to bring to justice the men who'd killed their uncles and fathers and brothers uh, and to end their impunity. And that was, that was one of the better days I've lived, was to, to see the, the way it empowered those kids. Uh, these are kids, incidentally, between the ages of eight and about 16. They've never seen a television. They've never seen a magazine with pictures of what military weapons look like. So these are all absolutely fresh images from their minds. And uh, the government of Sudan says none of this is happening, obviously. I am a Zionist agent, uh, and uh, everything I tell you is simply <coughs> meant to manipulate the West to hate uh, Arab and Muslim countries, because, of course, you only have to look at Iraq, Palestine, and Afghanistan to see what we're up to. And there's the problem, actually. Yes, there is. We do lack credibility. Um, in a, a word about uh, the government of Sudan. Um, I mentioned the fact that the women have been raped. Um, I interviewed dozens of women when I was in Darfur, and every one of them from the age of about six to 80 had been raped. Uh, and, and that's another reason I say that rape is a, is, is a weapon of war. Uh, the president of Sudan, um, Omar Bashir, says that rape doesn't exist in Islam. He says, we don't have it. So in other words, all those women that I met were prostitutes. He also, incidentally, uh, he defines Islam as to cut, to stone, and to kill. Now, I'm willing to bet that quite a lot of people who rejoice in being Muslims do not define their religion in that way, but that's how he does. Um, he also calls his best friends, Ahmadinejad of Iran, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah. And these, it's relevant that I tell you this because the reason that the British government and the Americans are gonna do nothing about Sudan is, wait for it, that we believe that Bashir is on our, are on our side in the war on terror. This is a man who gave sanctuary to Osama bin Laden for five years, and he has leveraged that so cleverly, he has actually managed to convince the Pentagon and MI6 that he, an avowed Islamist, best friends with the Iranians, he is on our side in the war on terror, and that says so much about our racism and stupidity. I have actually had a conversation with a man at the Pentagon who said to me, Rebecca, you don't get it, they're really important things uh, at stake here. 
what's going to happen is the Sudanese are going to send their spies to Somalia and Yemen, where al-Shabaab, the, the local variation of al-Qaeda, is working. OK, now step back for a second here. This is an assumption by an American who should know better, an assumption that all Arabic is the same, and that all people in Africa are the same. So you could send a guy from Khartoum and actually imagine that he would fit in in Sana or Mogadishu. It would be like sending someone from Scotland to Alabama and actually imagining they would fit in. But that's, that's at the root of this problem, is our willful ignorance. We don't want to know it's genocide because we have another agenda. And it speaks, it speaks to our casual racism, frankly. The reason this picture, I think, is, is interesting is have a look at the skin colors. If you or I were to meet um, someone from Darfur and someone from Khartoum, in our ignorance, we would think that they looked the same because we don't know what we're looking for. But racial identity is in the eye of the beholder. It's how you choose to self-identify. Yes, there is lots of intermarriage, but what matters is how you self-identify. The children have drawn the victims with black skin and, the, and the, the people committing the genocide with light skin, whom they perceive to be Arabs. And in my mind, it's really very hard to argue that there isn't a, a, a racial element to this. Now, because I am a moron and I can't do uh, PowerPoints very efficiently, I've managed to chop off a really important part of this drawing. I ask you to look at the bottom right hand of the screen where you see a woman. She is attached by a rope to the woman in front of her who is attached to the woman in front of her. They are being led off to the airport at um, Al Janina where they are put onto planes and they're taken to Khartoum and they are distributed as presents to Sudanese armed forces officers to do what they like with and they are never seen again. And this is happening in the year 2011. This is an image from the slave trade. It is happening right now, and we don't care, because there seems to be a ratio of our interest. And it's about how dark someone's skin is. And if you're unlucky enough to have really dark skin, like these people, and if you, they don't have anything we want, we really don't care. As I said, the Sudanese government denies any of this is happening. And we're happy to go along with that, as I mentioned, because they are our good friends in the war on terror. And incidentally, those of you who are a bit older, you'll remember when we used to suck up to all kinds of monstrous dictators because they were on our side in the war against the communists. And there's nobody in this room old enough to remember when the colonial powers used to manipulate local ethnic groups uh, for exactly the same purposes, uh, to suppress everybody. So nothing's really changed. Anyway, there's the Sudanese flag flying behind that tank. So it makes it a little bit harder to argue that the Sudanese <coughs> aren't involved. OK, you're going to be happy to know that that's enough of the genocide pictures. And I'm now going to talk about the role of women in rebuilding their communities. These women are in northern Uganda. They were all abducted as child slaves by the Lord's Resistance Army. You will have seen in the news recently that President Obama is sending 100 uh, military advisors to try and finally get the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, there are 500 of them, and they're still rampaging around Central Africa, causing absolute mayhem, at least 300 attacks so far this year. These women are involved in a Network for Africa project. We are um, helping them to learn psychotherapy so they can become lay counselors. These are massively traumatized people. You have at least two million people in northern Uganda who endured 20 years of the Lord's Resistance Army. I interviewed someone who was abducted when she was six years old. What they made her do as part of the initiation, they gave her a knife and made her hack the head off her best friend. They then made her carry his head around all day. She was then in the bush for six 10 years where she was raped continually. I also interviewed uh, a guy who was about nine when he was abducted but from his village by the Lord Resistance Army. To brutalize him, they made him ch chew the arm off his best friend. And he was also then in the bush for years. Let's be 
clear, these folks are never going to get completely better. But what you can do is give them the basic tools of psychotherapy so they can manage their trauma. We did a baseline survey in northern Uganda. We found 40% of people had been forced to kill people. Uh, we found uh, everybody fixated on the idea of killing themselves at least every week. So massive post-traumatic stress. What we decided to do is to train local people, 2,000 of them, sort of community leaders, basics of psychotherapy. We chose the 50 best, trained them how to then help people conquer uh, and manage their trauma so they can get on with their lives and rebuild. We gave them a bicycle. And now they're lay counselors. They go out to villages. And in a culturally appropriate way that we would never understand, because we are white and privileged, uh, they are delivering. Um, it's been one of the most extraordinary things I've been involved with. You would hardly believe that within a matter of days, people are sleeping better. And, and when we talk about reconstruction and reconciliation, it is absolutely meaningless if people are still traumatized. You also, you know, you need a holistic approach to this. You also have to help them uh, earn money so they don't starve. And so the women, uh, having established this network of these 50 people on their bicycles, having sent along the messages about um, psychotherapy, uh, we're also sending along messages about rights and about HIV and about sustainable agriculture. It's as if we set out sort of nodes into this extraordinary, uh, completely abandoned place. Nobody has been there, nobody from the outside has been there for 20 years. Uh, and it, it is just really, it's been such a pleasure. That's one of the classrooms. It's been such a pleasure to be involved in this. Uh, to see uh, the women in particular um, rising above the circumstances, nobody ever describes themselves as a victim. They say, I am a survivor. Now, how can you not want to help someone who defines themselves as a survivor? rather than a victim. Uh, no self-pity at all. Just you know, give us the tools and let us get along with that. Um, this is not directly relevant to this. One of the other things we do is we've got three schools in Rwanda for genocide survivors. That little lad, I love this photo because he looks so earnest, doesn't he? And he's so keen to learn. Um, and you know, he'll walk miles every day to get to that school. Uh, and, and quite often, the kids faint from hunger. Uh, and we did a, an anonymous survey and asked them how often they ate, and it turned out once every three days. And still, I have donors in the UK who say to me, Rebecca, you shouldn't let these Africans have something for nothing. You should charge them. This is a project for uh, Rwandan genocide survivors. Uh, they are making jewelry that we sell in the United States with the profits of this jewelry, the jewelry I'm selling over there for 10 pounds a string, with the profit from that, they educate and they feed their children. And, and in my mind, this is how you break the cycle of poverty. Instead of being a bunch of interfering white people who come along with absolutely no idea about the culture, we thought we'd try something different. We thought we'd ask them what they thought they needed. And one thing I've learned is that people may be illiterate, but it does not mean they're stupid. It just means they never got a chance to go to school. And very often, they know what the solution is. And yes, we are teaching these women about their rights. But the biggest right of all is the right to learn to read and write and get control of your life. And so we have a one-year course. And apart from teaching them a skill, we also teach them to read and write. And it is a beautiful thing to watch a woman discover the magic of words and to be empowered. It is simply extraordinary how the ability to read and write adds to a woman's self-confidence. Uh, and she blossoms. Uh, one of the, those beads, incidentally, are made of recycled paper that uh, rich expatriate whites in Kigali throw out. And my ladies go around collecting magazines from garbage bins. And they make them into those very pretty uh, bits of bits of jewelry. And as I say, I think it's a practical way of uh, breaking the cycle of poverty. But also, one of the great uh, things for me recently is, is that finding within a year of some of these women learning to read and write, they form women's cooperatives, and they get involved in local politics. Because they suddenly say, I have rights. I have an opinion. For years, I was told I was nothing. But now I can read and write, and I understand. This whole world has opened up to them. 
and I'm so pleased that uh, one of our uh, most amazing women has now stood and been elected to the local council. And frankly, that's, that's the way forward. Uh, it really is. It's, it's simply been a lovely thing to be involved in. Um, and that's something I do want to stress is that for every act of vileness in a genocide, there is an act of beauty as well. I think of a woman called Patricia, who's one of the women who makes these beads. Uh, she was a Tutsi, uh, a shopkeeper in Rwanda. Anyone who tells you that it was all about race is, is, as so often in these cases, missing the fact that social class was also involved in, in the reason why this genocide happened. And so Patricia and her husband were, were, were picked out uh, when the uh, Interahamway came to her village. They're the first to be taken. They killed uh, Patricia's three children. They killed her husband. They gang raped her on the ground as they dismembered her husband beside her. And then they made her walk naked around the village to humiliate her. Now, when I met Patricia in 2004, she had three kids. And this confused me because I knew that she'd, her children had been killed. And I said to her as, as um, sensitively as I could, who are these children, Patricia? And she said, they're my children. And I said, how long have they been with you? And she said, oh, well, uh, after the genocide ended, I found these three children in the road. And they were orphans because their mom and dad had been killed. So I took them in. Now, Patricia lived in a hut with nothing, nothing whatsoever. And so by taking in these three children, she had just complicated her life massively because she didn't have enough food to feed herself. And I said to her, Patricia, why did you do this? And she looked at me like I was insane. And she said, because it was the right thing to do. And that, to me, is the spirit of Africa. And one of the reasons I wrote that book is because I'm sick of people portraying survivors of genocide as weak. That's exactly not my experience. These are resourceful, resilient people without self-pity, a strength that most of us would not show in those circumstances. Uh, they have been tested, as most of us will never be tested. And it annoys me so much when we portray Africans as, as pitiful people in refugee camps, helpless, absolute rubbish. What we ought to do is listen to what they tell us they need and respond accordingly. And I end on uh, a simple solution that empowers women women in this case in a post-genocidal situation, and I know you're sitting there thinking, what on earth is that? It costs 30 pounds, $47, and it is a solar lamp. And it's something that uh, the women we work with tell us changes their lives, transforms their lives. Now, when you look at the problems of Africa, sometimes you can get overwhelmed, and you think, where do I begin? Well, here's a really simple solution. By giving a woman a solar lamp, not only does it mean that she can work and study after six o'clock at night in her hut when the sun goes down, it also means her children aren't breathing in paraffin. Paraffin, incidentally, is incredibly expensive, and huge numbers of children in Africa get respiratory problems from either inhaling paraffin smoke or, or fire, uh, wood fire. Also, it's uh, a huge number of children in Africa, I think more than die of malaria, are affected by fire and burns, again, because of this, uh, because they fall into fires. Um, also, of course, in a country like Rwanda, the last thing they need is to be cutting down the trees because the environment is already denuded enough. And as if it wasn't good enough, also the incidence of women being attacked in their huts goes like that if you have a light in the hut. And again, as if that isn't good enough, during the daytime, the woman can use this 30 pound soda lamp to recharge people's cell phones, so she has a business. It's as easy as that. Thank you very much for listening. so short on time but it would be a shame not to take a few questions so um yeah okay <laughs> um, we'll take one from the back there <laughs> yes uh, hi i like first of all i'd like to thank you for your efforts on the behalf of women all over the world who have been sexually exploited uh, but i have just one little problem 
you mentioned someone at the Pentagon you were talking to. Now, it's been my personal experience that the United States military has been responsible for more rape and more sexual exploitation than anything that's been demonstrated here so far. Uh, as a soldier in Vietnam, I saw rape on a daily basis, pedophilia, you name it, I saw it. But it, actually, it took a while. I was discussing this with some other people. I was there about a month before it really dawned on me what was happening. There's a report that since 1952, almost 50,000 women have been abused by their own soldiers. In fact, I know personally, because I'm in the anti-war movement, that women have reported to me, women soldiers, that in Iraq, they're afraid to go to the shower at night because they're being raped by their own soldiers. I think that it's important in this particular issue to lay the blame where it lies. All too often, you know, it's, it's like it's an, it's an aberration in the Western world, <coughs> but it's the order of the day somewhere else. I'm not saying that you're saying that. You know, but I think there are a few things you're not aware of. You know, and so to give you the information, there's a report from the Denver Post a couple of years ago. It's called Betrayal in the Ranks, where women, spouses, and soldiers talk about their sexual exploitation. Soldiers are coming home and killing their wives, killing their girlfriends. Some women are actually killing their husbands also. But the vast majority of the victims are women. United States Army had a bravo in Vang Tau, Vietnam. Everybody knows it but you people. We knew it. You understand? So there's a lot of hypocrisy here. And it must end or we will not find an answer to the total problem. I mean, I'm really upset by it because on Monday I embark upon a film project which touches on this subject of soldiers abusing women in Germany. You know, so this subject, and somebody that I personally know, a personal friend of mine, so this subject is near and dear to me, plus my own experiences. So when I hear people talk about the exploitation of women, and I've been talking to some of the women here, you know, that, I mean, I never abused anybody in my life, you understand? And I'm proud to say that. And you talked about that light. You talked about the light in the tent. Let me be the light in the tent. Let a man be the light in the tent. Let a brother be the light in the tent. You understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an inanimate object. We need flesh and blood, human beings taking up this issue. That's all I need to say. Oh, thank you very much for sharing that. And I, but if I gave the impression that I thought that, no, I, 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 was I, wait, wait, that I wasn't Africans castigating did, you. I, no, 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 sure, no, but I, no. I absolutely. You know, I, I, when I was involved in Bosnia, um, the peacekeepers who had white skin. Oh, were, black, black skin, they got they, black soldiers there. They were collecting together yeah. orphans in Sarajevo yeah. and holding them hostage and raping them at their convenience. Yeah. Yeah, right. And we wondered why some of the little Bosnian girls had scars on their cheeks, and it was because they were being forced to go and uh, give oral sex to the soldiers through barbed wire offenses. That's our taxes at, at work. So no, I'm, I, I know it's a universal problem, but I try and stick to the subject I know. If any of you, I know we've run out of time, if any of you are at all interested, please come and get one of my cards, which is over there, and, and please buy the novel as well. Thank you.